these are a few highlights of uh, what we'll be covering to fit just on one screen. Uh, in order to be sure that I say everything I want to say and do it in the limited time available, I've uh, written out my lecture. I hope you won't find that uh, uncomfortable. Well, in the space of less than an hour, I'm going to attempt to give you an introduction to a subject that is almost as vast as it is vital, namely money. What I will tell you is what money is, uh, what its existence makes possible, I'll explain how money came into existence and why gold in particular came to be money. I'll give you a statement of the quantity theory of money and indicate its great explanatory value in understanding the subject of inflation and the growth of monetary aggregates, such as so-called gross domestic product, GDP. I'll explain why under economic freedom, gold would almost certainly become money once again and how such a gold monetary system would serve as a powerful check on the expansion of government and would operate to prevent inflation, and in its pure form, known as a 100% reserve gold standard, would operate totally to prevent deflation and depression as well as inflation. I will indicate how the abuse of money through government interference is what is responsible for the problems of inflation and deflation and the closely related boom-bust business cycle. This interference includes the government's sanction and sponsorship of dishonest behavior by private banks in the form of credit expansion, i.e. the granting of loans out of newly created money. I'll indicate further consequences of the government's abuse of money through inflation, namely not only its own unchecked growth and the business cycle, but also capital decumulation and the consequent undermining of the productivity of labor, the arbitrary redistribution of wealth and income, and worst of all, the potential total destruction of money and all that depends on it. As to the remedy, well, that will be the subject of my class on monetary reform. Money has been defined as a generally accepted medium of exchange. In simple language, it's a good that everyone in a society is willing, indeed eager, to accept in exchange for his own goods or services. And once they obtain money, people subsequently use it in order to re-exchange it for the goods and services of others, who are just as eager to accept it from them. To all appearances, it seems that everyone is willing to accept money in the conviction that everyone else is willing to accept it from him. I promise to show very soon how this seeming logical circle is broken. And now uh, for the importance of money. However it is that money comes into existence, the fact that it does exist is enormously beneficial. Without it, the division of labor society on which modern material civilization depends uh, could not exist. A division of labor society is characterized by the fact that each individual lives by producing or helping to produce just one, or at most a relatively small number of things, practically all of which are consumed by others. At the same time, almost everything that any individual consumes in such a society is produced by the labor of others. Just think of any job you may have had, and how specific was the nature of that job, and who ultimately physically benefited from its being done. If, for example, you worked in a button factory, the physical beneficiaries of your work were the people who got those buttons on their shirts or whatever. Then think of all of the kinds of work that are done by other people in producing all the things you consume, from automobiles and air conditioners to products containing zirconium. Among the benefits of a division of labor society is the fact that the volume of knowledge employed in production is radically increased. Instead of everyone living as a self-sufficient farmer and having the same meager knowledge pertaining to production, the volume of knowledge employed in production comes to reflect the combined bodies of knowledge of all the different specializations. And every individual benefits from this radically enlarged body of knowledge in his capacity as a buyer of other people's products. A division of labor society would not be possible in the absence of money. In the absence of money, goods and services would have to be exchanged in barter for other goods and services. 
The producer of each good or service would have to find some way of exchanging the specific good or service that he produced for all the goods and services he desired from everyone else. For example, the producers of sulfuric acid, ball bearings, steel girders, computer chips, haircuts, and whatever would have to find some way of using their goods and ser- or services in exchange for food, clothing, and shelter. But how many grocers or farmers, clothing stores or clothing factories, landlords or mortgage lenders have any need of such goods, especially on any regular or reliable basis, and from any specific such supplier, such as this or that particular barber or other supplier? And how could the producers of such valuable indivisible goods as automobiles or houses use their products in exchange for goods of such small value as a loaf of bread? They could not break off a piece of a car or house and exchange it for the loaf of bread. In these and practically every other instance, a tremendously complicated and onerous process of indirect exchanges would have to ensue, such as perhaps exchanging computer chips for computers, exchanging computers for flour, assuming one can find a flour mill that needed computers at that particular time, and then exchanging flour for bread, assuming one could find uses for a truckload or warehouse full of bread. Ultimately, one would need to assemble all the varying collections of goods that would satisfy one's various employees, one's various business suppliers, and one's various personal suppliers, all of whom in turn would almost certainly be under the necessity of engaging in further complicated series of exchanges before they could obtain goods and services they actually wanted. Frequently, it would simply be impossible for people to obtain the goods they needed. And when it was not impossible, it would, it would be extremely costly, although no one would be able to know just how costly. For another, closely related problem that would exist in the absence of money would be the inability to calculate costs, with the result that no one could know whether or not his operations were successful. The computer chip manufacturer, for example, started out with so much silicon, such and so much chip making machinery and so forth, and now he's used up his silicon and part of the useful life of his chip making machinery and ends up with a quantity of bread or a variety of goods for which the bread can be exchanged. How could he possibly know whether he gained or lost by virtue of his activities? I'd like to observe here, incidentally, that precisely such ignorance of gain or loss exists in a socialist society, which, as von Mises demonstrated, also cannot calculate costs. In the absence of money, the only reliable means of obtaining life's necessities would be either to attempt to produce them oneself as a farmer or to produce goods or services of the kind farmers frequently needed. For example, be a blacksmith or a country doctor. But that would mean the destruction of the highly productive specialization of the modern division of labor economy and the loss of all manner of goods and services vital to a modern standard of living. The result would be dreadful impoverishment and mass depopulation. And if you want a historical precedent for such a thing, the destruction of money, you can look back to the third century A.D. and uh, you, can help to, you can understand a large part of the reason for the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. They destroyed money. The existence of money uh, prevents these problems. Because of money, it is not necessary for a producer to produce what any of his particular suppliers may want. It is only necessary for him to produce something that anyone, anywhere in the world wants, who is willing and able to pay money for, for it. Because once in possession of money, that producer is able to turn around and buy from anyone he wishes. For as we have seen, money is something that everyone wants. In this way, the existence of money radically widens the extent to which the division of labor can be carried. At the same time, it provides the intellectual basis for the conduct of a division of labor society. Because of money and the existence of money prices for all goods and services, producers are able to compare money revenues with money costs and know whether or not they are producing successfully. In a monetary economy, our computer chip manufacturer, for example, knows the money cost of his silicon and chip making machinery and the money value of the chips he produces and sells by virtue of using them up. Assuming that the buying power of money has not significantly fallen (coughs) between the time he purchased his means of production and the time he sells his product, 
a money profit signifies an increase in his ability to obtain goods and services in exchange from others and thereby marks his operation as successful. Closely related to this, the existence of money prices makes it possible to compare the costs of using different methods of production and to choose the most economical. It makes it possible to compare the profitability of producing different products and the profitability of investing in different branches of industry and to compare the remunerativeness of working in one occupation rather than in another. (coughs) Both by radically enlarging the extent to which the division of labor can be carried and by providing the essential guiding intellectual framework for its conduct, money makes possible modern material civilization. So far from being the root of all evil, it would be far more accurate to describe money as an essential foundation of practically all that is good in the material world. I turn now to the question of how money originates. Money originates in the conditions of barter. It originates by virtue of people seeking to exchange goods of what Menger calls lesser marketability for what he calls goods of greater marketability. The exchange of computers for compute, for, uh, the exchange of computer chips for computers in our previous discussion would be an example of such an exchange on the assumption that more people are ready to accept computers in exchange for their goods or services than are ready to accept computer chips. To the extent that this is the case, obtaining computers in place of computer chips would make it easier for the chip manufacturer to obtain the goods and services he ultimately wanted. At any given time and place, some goods are more frequently desired by more people than are other goods. For example, even now, (coughs) cigarettes are very widely desired. Certainly they are desired by far more people and with far greater frequency than is one's old typewriter. In the absence of the existence of money, it would make sense for the owner of such a typewriter who wished to exchange it for food or medicine, say, to exchange it for cigarettes, even though he personally did not smoke and perhaps personally abhorred smoking. This is because he would be more likely to find someone in possession of food or medicine who would take cigarettes in exchange for them than he would be to find someone prepared to accept his old typewriter in exchange for them. The principle here is that starting with some good possessing greater marketability on the basis of its use as an ordinary commodity, a new and additional demand for it emerges based on that fact. This new and additional demand serves to make the good even more widely and easily marketable than it was initially. In our cigarette example, the number of people ready and willing to accept cigarettes in exchange for their goods now includes not only the original core group wanting cigarettes to smoke, but a further group, consisting both of smokers and non-smokers who want cigarettes for the purpose of re-exchanging them with those who do wish to smoke them. Now, the market does not distinguish between the motives of those willing to accept a good in exchange, and to any observer, it will now appear simply that cigarettes are more widely acceptable in exchange than before. This, of course, increases their usefulness as a medium of exchange and and can thus serve to further increase the demand for them as a medium of exchange. The ultimate limit of this process is that everyone ends up willing to accept cigarettes in exchange for his goods or services. And after a while, it appears simply that everyone accepts cigarettes because everyone expects everyone else to accept them. But the truth is that the initial foundation is in the goods greater marketability as an ordinary commodity. The growing demand for a good uh, for use as a medium of exchange, the demand which will ultimately render that good money once its use as a medium of exchange becomes general, that demand serves to raise the good's value. In the case of cigarettes, it is entirely possible that if their supply were sufficiently limited, the rise in their value would be so great as to deter even the most ardent smokers from smoking very much. For, then they would be, for they would then be smoking valuable money. If that were the case, the appearance of paradox would take on a further aspect. Not only would it appear that everyone accepted the monetary commodity simply because everyone else did, but also that the monetary commodity had no significant physical uses. Well, these considerations apply to gold, the actual money of the world for many centuries. Gold is by no means a commodity with merely trivial physical employments. 
When properly alloyed, it can be made to do most of the things that other metals, such as lead, copper, or even iron can do. And it has unique properties as well, some of them of great use in the most modern technological applications. However, gold is very rare in nature, much rarer than most other metals. The combination of its utility and rarity establish, uh, establishes a value high enough to prevent the use of gold for purposes that can be served by other more abundant metals and limit its use to purposes that require its more or less unique properties. The very existence of a high value of gold based on its use as a physical commodity serves to create additional uses for it. One such use is the giving of objects made of gold as gifts expressing high esteem for the recipient. The same point, of course, applies to other goods combining high value and great beauty, such as diamonds. This additional demand serves further to increase the value of gold and to make it still more suitable for expressing one's esteem for the recipient of a gift. The second, and potentially much more important new and additional use for gold that its high value can create, is the use of gold as a store of purchasing power. That is, as something which one saves in order to have the means of buying in the future. I believe that this use, usually described as gold's use as a store of value, directly underlies its development into a medium of exchange. Now, Menger and many other Austrians, of course, believe that the use of gold as a medium of exchange precedes its use as a vehicle for saving. Uh, certainly, the potential for this kind of development, money developing out of the saving of gold, the potential for this kind of development was well underway in the 1970s and could occur again in the future any time inflation comes to be widely perceived as a great and growing threat in the United States. Inflation destroys the value not only of fixed income investments, such as bonds and life insurance policies, but also the real value of stocks and family businesses. It does the latter by virtue of the fact that it both artificially boosts business profits and at the same time the replacement prices of the assets which are used up in earning those profits with the result that the far greater part of the additional profits is required for the replacement of assets. However, the additional profits are treated by the government as ordinary income and are thus largely taxed away, which makes the funds available for the replacement of assets insufficient. This consequence of inflation goes a long way in explaining such phenomena, I believe, as the Rust Belt. Now, I know I've gotten way ahead of myself here, and I'm now indicating something I had originally planned to leave for much later, namely how inflation causes capital decumulation, but I've had to deal with it here instead. In circumstances in which inflation renders all the normal forms of investment open to most people unprofitable in real terms, as is the case in the present discussion, people turn to inflation hedges, to things they can buy and hold whose price can be expected to rise more or less in line with the general run of prices, and thus leave them with at least substantially undiminished buying power rather than actual losses of buying power. Gold is the ideal inflation hedge for most people. As a metal, it will not die or rot, as will animal and vegetable products. And as a precious metal, representing great value in small bulk, its storage costs are low. For example, even now, one ounce of gold represents the same buying power as perhaps a ton or more of iron, a fact which results in a radically lower cost of storing buying power in the form of gold rather than iron or other base metals. The fact that as a metal, every ounce of gold of the same fineness is a perfect substitute for every other such ounce and is also divisible and recombinable gives gold important advantages over precious stones as an inflation hedge. In any case, in the 1970s, the growing demand for gold as an inflation hedge was in process of making gold a good desired by a group of people comparable in number to cigarette smokers. The existence of a group of people that numerous who would be willing to accept gold in exchange for their goods or services in order to add it to their holdings for provision for the future would have had the potential for making others willing to accept gold in the conviction that they could re-exchange it with those eager to save gold. As in the case of our cigarette discussion, 
the potential would have existed for everyone becoming willing to accept gold in exchange and thus for a spontaneous remonetization of gold. Now, I believe that gold originally became money on essentially this kind of foundation, namely its advantages as a store of value. People wanted to save, but in the ancient times, they did not have securities markets or banks. They essentially had to save physical commodities. Uh, Gold was the most logical physical commodity for most people to save. I want to say that von Mises was very eager to see the process of growing gold ownership continue and firmly opposed all impediments to it. His reason, which I fully share, is that the worst conceivable threat posed by inflation is the destruction of money, however remote this possibility may seem at the present moment. For reasons indicated in our discussion of barter, that would destroy the division of labor and thus modern industrial civilization. But widespread gold ownership would provide the foundation for the rapid replacement of paper money with a new gold money and thus prevent inflation from resulting in the destruction of money as such. It would only destroy the paper money. Well, much of our discussion up to now has implicitly centered on the fact that there is a demand for the commodity that serves as money, whether it is cigarettes, gold, or whatever, and that this demand plays an enormous role in determining the value of the monetary commodity. Once something comes to serve as money, its value reflects the demand for it as money. It is substantially higher than it would be if the good did not serve as money. For example, historically, the value of gold was enormously increased by virtue of the fact that it served as money. And in recent years, It has declined as the result of various central banks selling off portions of what had been monetary holdings of gold. However, once a good becomes money, the determination of its value from the side of the demand for it can thereafter be taken as more or less constant in the absence of major disturbing forces. If we can take for granted the value of the monetary commodity insofar as it is determined from the side of demand, we can turn to what I consider to be one of the most important propositions in all of economics, namely the quantity theory of money. The quantity theory of money can be understood as the proposition that the quantity of money that exists is the major determinant of the amount of money that is spent. To illustrate this proposition, recall some old Western movie you may have seen featuring a bedraggled old prospector, perhaps played by Gabby Hayes, the character with a vocabulary of synthetic curse words like gall durned and dad blasted. Imagine that he finally strikes gold, digs enough gold nuggets out of the ground to fill a small pouch, and heads off into town. His new and additional gold will be physically manufactured into new and additional gold coins, which he will spend in buying supplies and such things as rounds of drinks at the local saloon. The recipients of that spending will in turn respend that new and additional money. The recipients of their spending will do the same, and so on ad infinitum. The result is that the new and additional money serves to permanently elevate the level of spending. So long as the new and additional money remains in existence, the volume of spending in the economic system will be correspondingly larger. The quantity theory of money, of course, applies to every money, irredeemable paper money as well as gold money. Now, I have to interject here that a system of irredeemable paper money can come into existence only on the foundation of a pre-existing commodity money, such as gold. It, It begins as paper that is not irredeemable, but rather fully redeemable on demand for gold. Without this foundation, it would have no greater chance of being accepted than would be the paper money from the game Monopoly, because it would lack a pre-existing recognized exchange value. However, once enough time goes by for a generation or more of people to grow up with the constantly repeated experience of redeemable paper money being eagerly accepted in exchange for goods and services and observing little or no actual day-to-day use of gold coin, the demand for money is transferred to the paper money. In such conditions, the demand for paper money may not be greatly reduced even though it then loses its convertibility to gold. In the United States, the day-to-day use of gold coin had virtually disappeared by the time of our entry into World War I. What was responsible was the National Bank Act of 1863, which for the first time created a uniform national paper currency convertible into gold. 
I must point out that the increase in the quantity of money and the increase in the volume of spending that it fuels is the only factor that explains the growth or continuing growth in monetary aggregates, such as aggregate consumer sales revenues, which can be taken as a rough approximation of GDP, and the aggregate value of business assets and of outstanding securities in the economic system. In the absence of the increase in the quantity of money and volume of spending that it supports, all such monetary aggregates would tend to stabilize. Increases in the physical volume of goods produced and assets accumulated could certainly continue at an undiminished or even higher rate than would otherwise be the case, but the result would be correspondingly falling prices and falling unit costs, not increases in the monetary aggregates. Well, we can turn now to gold as the proper kind of money. An essential difference between gold money and irredeemable paper money is precisely the rate at which their quantities can be increased. Gold is rare in nature and must be laboriously dug out of the ground, almost always at considerable cost. Paper money can be produced at hardly any cost and in virtually limitless quantity. If the production of paper money were subject to the freedom of competition, with everyone legally free to manufacture it, it would quickly become valueless. Having no greater cost of production than goods like paper clips, pins, or rubber bands, and capable of being expanded in supply just as easily, it would soon have no greater exchange value than they. Just as it now takes millions of pins to equal the value of an automobile or a house, so it would very soon take millions of paper dollars. Indeed, billions and trillions of paper dollars for the manufacture of $10, $100, and $1,000 bills is no more costly than the manufacture of $1 bills and can be just as easily expanded. Indeed, under freedom of competition between irredeemable paper and gold, the rapid depreciation of the paper would cause it to become altogether valueless. The demand for paper money would fall to zero as people sought the growing alternative of a gold medium of exchange, which would develop not only as the result of gold's growing use as an inflation hedge store of value, but also because people with sums of money to be paid to them in the future would more and more choose to have those sums payable in gold, whose purchasing power could be relied upon. This development would make gold all the more acceptable in exchange because people with debts or other contracts payable in gold, such as a lease, would be eager sellers for gold to obtain the, meeting, the means of meeting uh, their gold obligations. In such circumstances, the only way that paper money could stay in existence would be by being made securely redeemable on demand in gold. For it would be gold with its stable, indeed increasing purchasing power that people wanted, not irredeemable paper with its rapidly falling buying power. What stops the triumph of gold, the obvious money of a free market, is the fact that we do not have a free market in money. On the one hand, the government makes the issuance of irredeemable paper currency its monopoly privilege. Its manufacture by anyone else is called counterfeiting and is punishable by law. This serves to restrain the rate of increase in the quantity of such money. The increase still continues, of course, and is still far more substantial than is the increase in the supply of gold, but it does not reach astronomical levels, at least not for a more or less indefinite time. On the other hand, and this is actually the more important factor, the competition of gold is substantially hobbled by measures ranging from the total prohibition of the private ownership of gold to refusals to enforce the terms of private contracts made in gold and subjecting gains from such contracts to rates of taxation high enough to take away the incentive to enter into them. Another major impediment, another major impediment is the government's prohibition against merchants accepting gold coins at their bullion value rather than their face value. For example, you see on the screen both a $20 bill and an old $20 gold coin, actual size and uh, enlarged. The $20 gold coin contains approximately one ounce of gold. I hope everyone can see the, uh, the, at least the part of the bill. <clears throat> All right. 
The $20 gold coin contains approximately one ounce of gold, which has recently been worth approximately $280. If merchants were free to accept gold coins at their bullion value, that freedom would serve as a repeated demonstration of the superiority of gold over paper because people would then see that the rise in prices was confined largely to the paper money. For example, what cost $280 in paper would cost only $20 in gold. Imagine you're at a very fancy restaurant with two couples and some expensive wine. The check comes for $280, but you're given the choice, pay $280 on your credit card or in currency, or one $20 gold piece. Well, you'd see what cost 280 in paper cost only 20 in gold. A $28,000 car would be 2,000 in gold. A $280,000 house would be 20,000 in gold. Indeed, if one started to think of the gold coin as being $20, and notice, you see, it says $20, United States of America, uh, $20. Well, Uh, If people started to think of that gold coin as $20, if one said, that's what I mean by $20, that's the constitutional money of the United States, then they might come to the conclusion uh, that the $20 bill, uh, being worth only one-fourteenth the value of the $20 of gold, that the $20 bill was actually $1.43 in gold, and that the paper dollar was Uh, 7.1 gold cents if uh, if each gold dollar has a bullion value of uh, 14 times the paper. Now such lessons, uh, what would be impressed upon people is that the rise in prices is the result of the fact that we are expressing prices in cheap money. And in fact, as gold started to get more valuable, if it became uh, more widely desired as a store of value, and uh, began to develop into a medium of exchange, its price in paper would go far, far above 280, and uh, the uh, depreciation of the paper would be more visible. Well, such lessons would lead people to want to make contractual sums owed them payable in gold rather than paper. Imagine uh, you're making a contract, you're going to have a pension. Well, do you want your pension payable in paper that's only going to depreciate, or payable in gold? I think there'd be a lot of people... Uh, opting to have all kinds of contracts payable in gold. Now, the rapid increase in the quantity of paper money, i.e. the extent to which it increases more rapidly than the supply of gold, is the fundamental feature of inflation. It is the explanation of generally rising prices, of debtors gaining at the expense of creditors, of exchange rate depreciation, and of every other feature of inflation. A gold money, in contrast, even though it too serves to increase spending, would probably not raise prices, because the modest increase in its quantity would most likely be within the limit of the increase in the production and supply of ordinary goods and services, with the result that most prices would probably fall, as they actually did over the course of the 19th century. The best definition of inflation is precisely an increase in the quantity of money in excess of the increase in the supply of gold. And this definition, incidentally, can be found in uh, Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, and as far as I know, is original with him. An enormous difference between gold money and irredeemable paper money, which von Mises identified, is the radical difference between them with respect to the relationship they engender between the citizens and the government. Gold money makes the government financially dependent on the citizens. Irredeemable paper money makes the government financially independent of the citizens and makes the citizens financially dependent on the government. Under gold money, whatever funds the government may possess at any given time leave its possession and enter the pockets of the citizens who produce everything the government buys. To continue its operations, the government must regularly turn to the citizens for fresh money. It cannot obtain the gold it needs from any other source except the citizens. It is financially dependent on them. And the result is that every act of government spending is easily perceived as imposing a corresponding burden on the citizens. Every proposal for increased government spending in such circumstances represents an equivalent threat of increased taxes. 
with the further result that such proposals encounter strong resistance and are likely to fail. A policy of budget deficits under a gold standard is not an option. Every year of deficits increases the government's interest burden while doing nothing to increase its revenues. Indeed, amounting public debt under a gold standard brings with it the specter of default and results in the withdrawal of capital and of gold from the country and a reduction in the volume of spending and revenues in that country, including, of course, the government's tax revenues. The consequence is that all but the most recklessly irresponsible governments are compelled to operate with balanced budgets, which places them under the necessity of providing for all government expenditures out of current tax revenues. But under irredeemable paper money, conditions are entirely different. The ability to create such money gives the government a source of funds that does not depend on the citizens. The government now has its own independent source of funds, the printing press, or indeed simply ledger entries on the books of its central bank that enlarge its checking balances. In these circumstances, proposals for increased government spending do not appear as constituting any threat of increased taxes. The government is perceived as standing outside the economic system, free of the financial constraints that still apply to all the individual citizens. It can finance additional spending without raising taxes, for it now has its own independent source of money. This transforms the character of political debate and results in an unchecked increase in government spending and government activity. The cost of new government programs no longer appears as a reason for rejecting them because the connection between their cost and higher taxes has been broken. Political debate now proceeds with the supporters of the programs enumerating their benefits to this or that group and the opponents appearing to have no basis for their opposition other than some form of inherent naysaying or misanthropy. In just this way, the so-called liberals, i.e. the interventionists and socialists, appear as the enlightened friends of mankind, while their conservative opponents are made to appear as the enemies of all that is good, beautiful, and true. Indeed, things go even further. The nature of the radically changed monetary conditions drives the citizens to the conclusion that instead of them having to support the government, the government can support them. For in fact, it is the government from whom they now obtain their money. The government's ability to create money appears as a magical bottomless purse from which the government is able to shower benefits on the people, not only providing free, benefic free benefits to the beneficiaries of its programs, but also enriching everyone else, everyone who receives the additional revenue and income generated by the continuing expenditure of the new and additional money. It is the mentality of the free lunch carried to the point of believing in a free breakfast and dinner for those who prepare the free lunch. Its essence is expressed in Keynesianism and its doctrine of the government spending multiplier. An important manifestation of this belief of, of this mentality, an important manifestation of this mentality is the belief that Washington, a city devoid of practically all actual production, a city populated by hardly anyone but bureaucrats living on goods produced elsewhere while doing almost everything in their power to hamper economic activity everywhere, can somehow bail out economically far more important cities such as Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, or New York. Indeed, bail out entire states and regions and the entire rest of the country. What permits this delusion is the fact that Washington is where the irredeemable paper money originates. However, another major proposition of monetary theory that can be found in von Mises, and which is highly relevant here, is the fact that unlike ordinary goods such as coal and cloth, whose physical ability to serve human needs depends on their physical quantity, a larger quantity of money does not provide any greater physical utility than does a smaller quantity. A $1 bill of a few decades ago bought as much or more than does a $10 bill today. What a unit of money can buy depends on prices. The effect of the government's increase in the quantity of money is merely to make prices higher than they would otherwise have needed to be. The citizens of the United States could produce an exchange as much as they now produce an exchange, indeed substantially more than they now do, entirely without the increase in the quantity of money caused by their government. 
The effect of that increase, indeed, has not only been to make prices higher, but also to work against the increase in the production and supply of ordinary goods by undermining capital accumulation and the rise in the productivity of labor, as, for example, in the way I explained earlier in connection with the taxation of profits that inflation creates and which are needed for the replacement of assets at the higher prices it causes. The public does not understand the consequences of the government's inflation and instead blames those consequences on the greed of profit-seeking businessmen. It looks at the sharply increased paper profits accompanying rise in prices and takes that rise in profits as proof of the businessman's responsibility for the rise in prices. The usual definition of inflation as being rise in prices also leads to this conclusion. For if inflation is rising prices, then it comes into existence only in the instant in which businessmen raise them by ordering the posting of higher prices on store shelves or in sales catalogs. The ignorant public then turns to the government, which it already views as Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, for protection from what it perceives as the malicious evil of the businessmen. It demands price controls. Still another major proposition of monetary theory that can be found in von Mises, and which, as far as I know, he was the first to discover and stress, at least in our era, is the fact that inflation does not serve to raise all prices at the same time and to the same extent, a fact which is not evident in thinking of rising prices as resulting from a rise in the volume of aggregate spending relative to the aggregate quantity of goods offered for sale however helpful that conception might otherwise be. Whoever introduces the new and additional money into the economic system enjoys a gain, in fact, the greatest gain that can be obtained from the process. He, he, usually, though not always the government, spends money he has not had to do anything to earn and buys the goods and services he buys at prices which have not yet risen or, uh, or have risen only to the extent his own buying has made them rise. To whatever extent the prices of the goods and services he buys do begin to rise, all other buyers of those goods and services suffer a corresponding loss in terms of their buying power. As the new and additional money travels from hand to hand, more prices rise. Those whom it reaches relatively early and whose selling prices and incomes rise sooner or to a greater extent than the prices they have to pay enjoy a gain from the process. However, those whose selling prices rise only later on or to a lesser extent than the prices they have to pay suffer a loss of buying power. Of course, all those who live on contractually fixed incomes or whose assets are contractually fixed in terms of money are easily capable of being wiped out entirely in terms of buying power. The government's inflation clearly constitutes an arbitrary redistribution of wealth and income and is one capable of assuming the proportions of a major violent revolution. For example, the German hyperinflation of 1923 constituted as great a redistribution of wealth and income as did the French and Russian revolutions. I want to conclude this lecture uh, by explaining how inflation is the underlying cause of the business cycle and of deflation. What is involved here is not a direct expansion of money by the government, but a government-sanctioned and government-sponsored process of inflation that von Mises calls credit expansion. Credit expansion is the creation and lending out of newly created money by private banks. It centers on the creation of what von Mises calls fiduciary media. Fiduciary media are transferable claims to standard money, payable on demand by the issuer, which are accepted in commerce as the equivalent of standard money, but for which no standard money actually exists. In today's conditions, fiduciary media can be understood as the totality of checking deposits insofar as they exceed bank reserves of standard money. Standard money, in turn, is nowadays to be understood as essentially the irredeemable paper currency. Under a gold standard, standard money would be gold, coin, and bullion. In all cases, standard money is money which is not a claim to anything beyond itself. At present, in the United States, checking deposits in one form or another comprise a minimum of approximately $2 trillion. The reserves of standard money behind them are a little more than $38 billion. 
Thus, the presently outstanding magnitude of fiduciary media in this country is approximately only 38 billion less than 2 trillion. The 38 billion of standard money reserves is a fractional reserve of less than 2%. Reserves relative to checking deposits have never been as meager as they are now. What allows the present situation to exist is only the ability and willingness of the Federal Reserve System to manufacture new and additional standard money to whatever extent is necessary to maintain the solvency of the banking system. Now, the existence of fiduciary media is what creates the potential for deflation. That is, a literal wiping out of money and a consequent reduction in the volume of spending in the economic system. This is because the overwhelming backing for fiduciary media is debt, the debts incurred by borrowers when the banks grant them loans consisting of fiduciary media. Those debts, those IOUs and securities, are held by the banks as by far the major assets standing behind their checking deposit liabilities. Whenever anything happens that causes a significant inability of debtors to repay their debts to banks, there is a corresponding reduction in the assets of the banks. Every such reduction threatens the ability of the banks to honor their fiduciary media. A mere 5% reduction in the assets of any given bank may be great enough to reduce its overall assets below the level of its outstanding checking deposit liabilities. And this would be true even if banks held much larger reserves than they now do. As soon as such a situation is perceived to exist, a run against that bank commences. The checking depositors who get there first are paid in full immediately. All others must wait for the liquidation of the bank's remaining assets and may end up being paid just pennies on the dollar or nothing at all. What is particularly important here and cannot be stressed too strongly is that whenever a bank becomes insolvent, its checking deposit liabilities immediately lose the character of money and assume the status of junk bonds that are in default. This change in the character of the checking deposits involved uh, constitutes a corresponding decrease in the quantity of money. This reduction in the quantity of money and resulting reduction in the volume of spending, remember the quantity theory of money, reduction in the volume of spending in the economic system causes business sales revenues and consumer incomes to fall, thereby further increasing the inability to repay debt and causing more bank failures and a further reduction in the quantity of money and volume of spending, causing still more bank failures and so on and on. Exactly this process is what occurred from 1929 to 1933. The system has the potential to collapse to the point of the total elimination of fiduciary media. And in the winter of 1933, appeared to be on the verge uh, of such collapse. Now, it should be realized, of course, that to whatever extent there is a reduction in the quantity of money and or volume of spending in the economic system, and government interference prevents a corresponding fall in wage rates and prices, the result is mass unemployment and unsold goods. What would totally prevent deflation is a 100% reserve gold standard, in which transferable claims to money payable on demand were fully backed by gold, coin, or bullion in possession of the issuer of such claims. In that case, no failure of debtors could jeopardize the quantity of money. Nothing would be present to reduce the quantity of money. Such a gold standard would be a guarantee against both inflation and deflation. I have to point out that fiduciary media are a product of government interference in a variety of ways, such as the government's having repeatedly allowed fractional reserve banks to suspend specie payment in violation of their contracts, its enlargement of the supply of standard money to bail out such banks, and all the various measures enacted by the government to promote public confidence in the system, such as government bank examinations and government deposit insurance. I should say also that I'm highly sympathetic with Rothbard's view that the very existence of fiduciary media represents a form of fraud, which in the very fact of its being allowed implies government interference of a kind similar in substance to the government's refusal to, to prosecute labor unions for acts of force. I'll try to explain what precipitates the initial financial failures that result in, in bank failures under a fractional reserve system, because this is what initiates the process of deflation 
and is capable of causing a significant contraction of spending, even in the absence of a decrease in the quantity of money. There are a number of related causes, all based on credit expansion. So if credit expansion didn't exist, if you couldn't create fiduciary media, if you had 100% reserve, these factors wouldn't be operative and we wouldn't have uh, any of these failures. I will deal only with malinvestment and the consequent sudden unavailability of credit, which is often described as a credit crunch. Credit expansion causes the waste of capital and the overexpansion of certain branches of production relative to others. Above all, the overexpansion of the branches in which the expenditure of the new and additional fiduciary media is concentrated. <laughs> this wasted capital and accompanying relative overexpansion of certain branches of production is what von Mises calls malinvestment. As soon as the credit expansion stops or substantially slows down, the malinvestment becomes visible. Firms find that they have less capital than they had assumed. The result is that they unexpectedly either need to obtain capital from outside sources or find that they are no longer in a position to make capital as readily available to others as they had previously believed themselves able. The further result is a rise in the demand for loanable funds and fall in the supply of loanable funds, which in the absence of continued credit expansion constitutes a credit crunch. The fact that credit expansion serves to raise wage rates on the prices of various raw materials and thereby reduces the buying power of any given magnitude of capital funds leads directly to this outcome as soon as the spigot of new and additional credit expansion is turned off. As the consequence of a credit crunch, there are firms with liabilities coming due that are simply unable to meet them. These firms become insolvent and go bankrupt. The specter of being unable to repay debt brings about a rise in the demand for money for holding. Firms need to raise cash in order to have the funds available to repay debts coming due. They can no longer count on easily and profitably obtaining these funds through borrowing, as they could under credit expansion, or indeed obtaining them at all through borrowing. They must accumulate them themselves. This increase in the demand for money for holding and consequent reduction in spending serves to reduce sales revenues and profits and thus further to reduce the ability to repay debt. Well, malinvestment, consequent credit crunch, and accompanying need to build up cash holdings in order to repay debt, these are the factors, all deriving from credit expansion, that precipitate the business failures that cause the initial bank failures and that can significantly reduce the overall volume of spending in the economic system, even without bank failures. Well, summary. I believe that I've shown all that I set out to show, namely what money is and the vital role it plays in making possible a division of labor society and thus modern material civilization. I've stated and explained the quantity theory of money to the extent that time permitted. I've shown how money develops out of barter and why gold in particular became money and would once again become money if freedom of competition prevailed with respect to money. I've shown how a gold monetary system would serve as a powerful check on the expansion of government by making people realize that it was they who had to pay for the government and that every expansion in the government's activities was at their expense. I've also shown how a gold monetary system would operate to prevent not only inflation, but in its pure form, namely the 100% reserve system, also deflation and depression as well. I've shown how it is government interference, including government sanction and sponsorship of fiduciary media and credit expansion, that is responsible for the problems of inflation and deflation and the closely related boom-bust business cycle. Along the way, I've also shown further consequences of the government's abuse of money through inflation, not only its own unchecked growth in the business cycle, but also capital decumulation and the consequent undermining of the productivity of labor, the arbitrary redistribution of wealth and income, and worst of all, the potential total destruction of money and all that depends on it. Now, I know that what I've just finished telling you about money this afternoon is very different from what you'd be likely to hear at most colleges and universities. I certainly hope you've found it a perspective worth your further study and that you'll find the time at some point to do some of the readings that I've recommended on the subject on my Mises Institute webpage, which I imagine will be made known at some point what its address is.